primarily. That means I'll be there directly. But we're going to start out in 2 Corinthians 4. You will never be the person you can be if it wasn't for pressure, if it wasn't for tension or discipline. If you take these three things out of your life, you're not going to be the person that God called you to be. Matter of fact, a lot of the things you're going through, God is putting you through it for a reason. I often said that God will put you in a fix to fix you. It's his, uh, you know, this is where character is built. I don't read when we get to heaven that there will be character built, that uh, our identity will already be set when we get there, uh, sons and daughters. All these things will take place. But pressure is so important. And to be able to handle pressure is so important. This is the third uh, lesson on his hour. Jesus talked about over and over, my hour has not come. You know, they tried to kill him, and he said, my hour has not come. They tried to take him out. He even told his family once, my hour has not come. In other words, he knew that his hour was on its way, that he came to die for us and for our sins and to redeem us. And so he kept using that phrase. Now, I know most of us do not live with that hour idea. We don't think about, okay, our hour's coming. Let me tell you, it is. All of us has an hour coming. We all have a season to live here, a span of in between the time you're born and the time you pass, that little dash. I've done hundreds of funerals. Uh, you know, I just try to keep from saying a thousand. I don't want to say a thousand, but I've done hundreds. And uh, when I think about all those times, no one's expected to go. You know, we just don't think about it, but it happens. Jesus knew his hour was coming. And that hour would take place in one night. And I've often used the phrase, uh, heaven or eternity hinges on that night. Everything Jesus did hinged on that night. If you take a hinge and you see a door move, that hinge is so important. And so what he decided to do this night would change everything. It has a cast of characters. It has three of the main disciples. I call them Pete and JJ. He, Jesus had a click. Some of you are so mad because you don't have a click to run with. That's your fault. I don't care if you're quiet. The reason you don't have a click is you ain't been friendly. Okay. The reason you ain't got a click is you ain't been friendly. You got to show yourself friendly to have friends. And if you're always spitting icicles, if you wear a porcupine outfit, nobody wants to embrace you. So it's important to understand that Jesus had the 12. And out of the 12, he really liked Pete and JJ, James and John. He brought Pete and James and I'll preach this way until I get some amens. <laughs> the issue is this. When your click disassociates other cliques, now you in sin. You should always be able to embrace the whole body. But there are people that you run with. They're your favorites. Patsy. I always look, and there you are sitting with your favorites. When I hear that somebody's from Jasper, I know they connected with you. Because I were a family from. I know all, I've been to Jasper. I've done funerals there for her. You were probably there. You just probably didn't know I had no hair then. <laughs> so when I think about this night, then we throw in a fourth disciple, Judas. Then we throw in 600 soldiers. We throw in a discussion with the Father. It all took place this night. Everything changed. We've already dealt with the washing of the feet, Judas's betrayal 
as he goes out into the night to do what he's fixing to do. Most of you know a lot of this story. We might pick up on a few things, but as we move toward this Easter, we got to remind ourselves, everybody here at some time or another is going to be under extreme pressure. And it's how you have pressure bust a pipe. Josiah fixed pipe out at the arena because pressure broke the pipes of PVC. Now we've gone to PEX, stronger. Amen. Sometimes some of y'all need to go to a different type of pipe. I don't mean that in a derogatory mean. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4, 17 says, For our light affliction. <clears throat> I like the way the scripture says it. Our light affliction. It ain't all that, it ain't all that bad. You just keep acting like it is. Which is but for a moment. You realize that the pain that you endured is already over? But while you were enduring it, you didn't think it would ever leave you? Huh? Did you ever think that? When, you, when you're under, when your nose is hurting, you think to yourself, this ain't never going to quit hurting. Well, you're easy to pick on today. <laughs> but when it's over, you th you, pretty soon you're going to take that bandage off. You'll forget you ever had that Brad Pitt nose job. For a lot of affliction, which is but for a moment, works. And when you see that ETH, that's out of usually the King James, it means it continually has not stopped. It's still doing it. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When I read it out of the uh, Message Bible, it'll say something like this. Go to the next one, please. These hard times are small potatoes compared to the coming times, the lavish celebration prepared for us. I mean, realize that, that we got some, this doggone thing. I knew it was going to be one of them days. No, oh, we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. The lavish celebration prepared for us. It's hard to believe that God loves us so much in our messed up state that he'd forgive us, love us, save us, redeem us, and then throw a party for us when we get home. <laughs> You think you've had parties here? Where do you get home? And when we all get home, oh, what a day that's going to be. So let's look at the night that eternity hinged on. And the tragedy of the cross came after a sequence of tragedies. We're going to find there was a garden known as pressure. The word was Gethsemane. We're going to find there's going to be a disciple who's going to betray him. We'll know him as Judas. There's going to be a close friend. His closest friend, Peter, the only disciple that walked on water. It was Peter, amen, is going to desert him. So we're going to see it's, it's what you go through in life by the will of God that empowers your future. So here in Matthew chapter 26, verse 36, it says, When Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. This was a place he often went to. It wasn't uh, uncommon. They knew where he prayed. As a matter of fact, Judas knew it. Judas knew where Jesus went. That's why he knew he was there that night. It wasn't something that, that uh, a secret. He always had that place. Many of you have a closet you pray in. You have a place you'd like to go to. You have a, uh, whether it be a, hey, uh, he always prays on his Harley, or she always prays uh, when she's at home in, in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, whatever room. I don't know, sister, what you got. Uh, but, but you always have a certain place that you like to go to. So they knew Jesus loved to go to Gethsemane. And the scripture says here, when he went there, the word again, that word Gethsemane, it means pressure. It was the oil press. I talked to my pastor this morning, and I was explaining to him my fatigue and my joints hurting. And he said, well, what do you think it is? I said, well, it's got to be this, this uh, muscular dystrophy thing I keep fighting with, you know, that I've struggled with for 63 years. And my mom and brother, and he said, well, I'll tell you what I've been doing. I've been taking uh, olive oil every morning. Excuse me. He said olive oil. I take two teaspoons of olive oil, and it's helped my digestion and my, and my uh, joints. And I said, oh, shoot fire. I'll, take, I'll start taking some. I'm give me a swig as soon as I get home, if I can find it. I got to hunt for it. But, but when he said that to me, it spoke to me. 
Because the oil keg is made out of the pressure. They would take the olives and they would squeeze and squeeze and squeeze until the oil came out of it. And, and all through Scripture, that olive oil is mentioned. And it just kind of hit me like a revelation that anything medicinal, God's already provided for us. You know, I mean, we've done gone to pharmaceutical and got ourselves in trouble, made big pharma this billion dollar company. But the bottom line, God's already put in the earth things for us to take care of ourselves with. Everybody say that? Amen. You understand that? If you eat right, you do right, and, uh, you know, garbage in, garbage out, you take care of your body, it's going to take care of itself. It's the truth. Amen. So I've, I've learned that, but the, he just threw something else at me I didn't even think about. It. I know some of y'all are going to go home right after church and get you a swig, ain't you? <laughs> Olive oil. <laughs> Keith. <laughs> but it, here in this garden, it, it's, it's prophetic that it was that place of pressure. It hit me that he went to a place that already had a connotation of pressure, and he goes in there, and, and it's, it literally is from the base word here, uh, burden, weight down, profound. It was a deep mystery. What was going to take place in this garden, we get a peek at it looking back. They couldn't see it going this way, but we look back at it, and we see what's happening here. It literally meant uh, uh, a deep mystery. We didn't understand what's happening here. But everything Jesus did in that garden prepared him for what God had prepared for him, what he was fixing to go. So the first thing he did, he went in the garden and he told the disciples, sit. Everybody say sit. When you're under pressure, you've got to learn to sit. Don't move. Don't make a panic-prompted mistake. Every accident I've ever been in was a panic-prompted mistake. I moved too quick. I, I, I uh, entered the freeway too fast. I hit the brake too quick on my Harley. Something happened. It was a panic moment. Uh, I, I laid a bike down coming here a couple of years ago. Richard was with me. It was a, it was a moment. Had I been, you know, I don't know. Was it my fault? Robert, who knows? All I know is I hit the brake, laid the bike down, slid along the road. Amen. $8,000 worth of damage to the bike. Jumped up, came here, preached, and didn't let y'all know it. Next night, I preached again. Didn't even tell my wife. Told her after church. The second, I got to wake up. Because it ruined my opportunity to preach because she'd get all over me. You got to learn how to handle your peace. Can I get an amen? <laughs> when the pressure's on to make a major decision, wait. Jesus has a major decision. He puts the disciples. He says, sit, you here. He brought them for a reason. It was to help them understand what's going to happen. He needed, there are times when you're under pressure, you need friends with you. You need those friends. You need, you need that click. You need the people that have, have, have hung out with you for a long time. They know you. They know your strength. They know your weakness. They understand you. So Jesus set them outside the garden. But what he needed to do, he needed to do alone. So he goes in and he begins to pray. When the pressure is on and your future hinges on a decision, you need to wait. You need to seek God. You need to have the peace of God. Psalm 62, 1, David said, my soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He's my fortress. I'll never be shaken. Isaiah said, but they that wait on the Lord, there's something about the word wait there. It means to stretch or twist until made strong. It ain't just sitting there. As a matter of fact, you know, they that wait on the Lord. I go into restaurants and I will go there and there will always usually be when I sit down a waiter. And that waiter is waiting on me. They want to serve me. Amen. As a matter of fact, oftentimes they serve me because they, they, there's a tip at the end of this thing, right? And it's according to how well you wait to how good you get your tip. Some of y'all ain't never got a good tip because you ain't never waited on the Lord. I don't mean. Some of y'all ain't never got a good tip because you ain't never waited on the Lord. Amen. If you wait on him some, amen, ain't no telling what you're going to get from heaven. That, that next crowd, if they mean like this, I'm going to have a problem. <laughs> they wait on the Lord. What are they going to do? When you wait on him, you renew your strength. You get your strength back. Amen. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They run, not be weary, and shall walk and not faint. This is the kind of scripture I need to hear today. Yeah. 
Amen. This is the kind of scripture you need to get hold of today. Waiting on God brings me strength. It helps me fly. It helps me move. It takes the weariness out of my life to wait on him. This night, man, everything was hinging on this night. They had to wait. And then Jesus goes into the garden and he begins to suffer. Something happened. Amen. As he began to pray, as he began to intercede, and I've, I've sweated in intercession. I've cried in intercession, but I have never bled in intercession. And Jesus did that. Mark 14 tells us he was exhausted from sorrow. He was wore out. Luke 22, 44 tells us in being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling in the ground. Amen. He was praying for you. He was praying for me. And the blood began to pop out of, his, out of his back and into his pores and began to saturate into his tunic. Amen. That which he was wearing. He's in the garden. The word there in the medical term is hermatidrosis, his bloody sweat. In other words, under such great emotional stress, these tiny capillaries in the sweat glands can break, mixing blood and sweat, causing weakness and shock. It was a fight for salvation. He was fighting for us, man. He meant he was going after it. It was a hard decision to go to the cross. It hinged on that night. And for three Three of them are sleeping. I mean, here he is with a bloody sweat, and here's Peter, James, and John outside the garden. When Jesus goes back out, they're sleeping. How, ma How many times, instead of waiting on God, we just sleep. We just give up. We just lock into complacency. Or we just go through the motions. We just do it because the Bible says to do it. We just go to church through the Bible. It, it has nothing to do with relationship. It has nothing to do because I love him, because I love you. So here he is in the garden. He needs his friends, his, 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 his compadres to stick with him. And he goes out of the garden, and here they are sleeping. Pete, James, John. <laughs> sleeping. I see them. There's James. James, the brother of John, he laid out. John, John laying there, got his head laid up on his brother James's chest. Because that's where John often had his head laying on the chest. Amen. To hear the heartbeat, he did it with Jesus. There's Peter. He's laid out down here at the feet of James. And he's using them like a pillow. He's got his feet stuck up near his face because that's often how Peter's life was. He had feet stuck up near his face. <laughs> he always had a foot in his mouth. He had toe jam between his teeth. <laughs> he went a little further. He fell on his face and he prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Come to his disciples, he found them asleep, and he said unto Peter, What could you not watch with me an hour? Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again a second time, and he prayed. He said the same thing. Oh, my father, this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it. You will be done. See, I believe there were three hours here. I believe he was praying an hour. I believe first he was in for an hour, and he came out, and they were sleeping. Then he went back, and he prayed another hour. Came back out, and he's sleeping. How many know when you sleep an hour, it goes by like that? It's just fast. How many know when you pray an hour, it takes eternity? It's, just, it's like it takes forever. I'm trying to pray an hour. Oh, God. Five minutes. <laughs> you know, you're praying. But not for Jesus. He was just used to communing with the Father. He goes out again, he prays again, amen, and he came and he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. Verse 44, and he left them, and he went away again. He prayed the third time, saying the same words. I don't believe it was a repetitious over and over, thy will, mine, not mine, thy will, not mine. I think he prayed, and then he just decided, you know what, I've got to surrender, I got to give in. Surrender is the hardest thing to do as a believer. We fight our will, our, what we want to do. 
I, I want to go there. I want to do this. I want to spend that. I, I want this, that, and the other. And God is yelling, I don't mind you doing some of those things, but right now I need you to do this. And you fight him, and you argue with him, and you wrestle with him, and, and, and you won't. But, he's, but if I could just surrender, if I could just give in. See, there's something powerful about the humanity of this moment. To allow his disciples to sleep. He, when he came out the third time, he allowed them to just keep sleeping. The hardship that they're going to endure is, you know, look, he's God in the flesh. But they just, they just little weak humans, and he knows it. So you're going to let them sleep? And there they, they're sleeping, and, and he uses this term, rest on now. I can see Jesus folding his arms now that he's given in, and he has surrendered to God himself. Not my will, but thine be done. Looking down at those disciples and saying to them, all right, all right, all right, y'all sleep. Just sleep on. And he's staring at them, and he's thinking, <laughs> Boy, I love you, James. You're a son of thunder. You'd call, you'd call thunder down and burn up Samaritans, just like your brother. You're a wild child. James, I'll be in the kingdom in the next day, three days from now. But not long after that, I'll see you there because they're going to take your head from your shoulders. You're going to be one of the first martyrs to die. Don't worry, you'll get your head back. <laughs> John, John, I love you, man. You know why I love you? Because you sure enough love me. And you write about it all the time. It's all about every time you write, you say, you the one that loves me. You're kind of selfish like that, ain't you? Well, I love you, boy. Mm -hmm. You're going to die of old age, but they're going to boil you in oil for my sake. And they're going to put you on an island called Patmos. But don't you worry, because I'm coming to visit you. I got a revelation I want you to write down. <laughs> Peter, whoo, boy, you're a mess. You go ahead and sleep. You're going to carry my word. You're going to preach it. You're going to, miracles going to take place. They're going to lock you in prison. I'm going to send angels to get you out. It's going to be an amazing life you've got ahead of you, sir. But one day they're going to crucify you upside down. Rest on, boys. Do you see it? You see it in your mind? What a, what a night. What a night. A night of total surrender. See, when you surrender to God, you get peace. Peace is deliberately adjusting your life to the will of God. Well, what is it you want from me? It's just tuning in and getting it right. He surrendered to God. If it be possible, may this cup take, take away from me, yet not as I will, but as you will, to his disciples. Y'all go ahead and sleep. And then here comes Judas, the betrayer. Amen. Did you know what Jesus called him? He called him friend. Friend? He said, friend? What did you come for? He's coming up the road, <clears throat> 600 soldiers with him, and he said, friend, he didn't call him fiend. He didn't call him betrayer. He didn't call him a wicked one, or, or, or uh, devil possessed. He just said, friend, oh, that hit me. Not only did he wash his feet, but he still reached it toward Judas. Friend, what are you doing here? And Judas kisses Jesus on the cheek. They asked the question, are you him? Jesus said, I am. 600 soldiers fall backwards into the ground. Now, again, I think I, I touched on this a couple of years ago. Uh, I was hunting it down again. But listen, there is a scene in, Mark, in the book of Mark where there's a boy that comes up in this scene, and he's wearing nothing but a sheet, a tunic. And at that moment, He's running toward Jesus. They reach, the soldiers reach to grab him. They grab the tunic, and he's running without any clothes. And I got to ask myself, where did this boy come from? You went to Bible college. Where did he come from? You got a study on it? Do you know it's in the Bible? It is. Mark, book of Mark. You know where I believe he came from? I believe when Jesus said, I am he 
the power of God came out, shook that grave, and he had been just recently buried and popped up from the grave. Amen. And began to chase Jesus. It had to be. There's some crazy stuff in this book. Be careful. It'll bite you. It'll get you. Friend, what did you come for? No, really, what was your real intention or motivation to get close to me? Psalm 41, 9. Even one. This is thousands of years before. It's prophetic. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted his heel against me. We were running together. I, I, I saw this, this funny thing where, where this uh, NBA player gets, gets tripped. He got tripped, and he fell down, and the ref, ref didn't call the, didn't call the, 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 the penalty. Didn't call a foul. And so, so the, the player looked up at the ref. He didn't call a foul. And so as the, the ref ran by, the player tripped the referee. <laughs> the referee hit the ground, jumped up, and called a technical on him. And he looked at him like, well, I didn't know that was a foul. <laughs> Hello. I thought that was funny. It, was really, it really was. <laughs> so, so here's that moment where he said he lifted his heel against me. He tripped me while we were running. We were in mid-stride, and Judas tripped me. He, it was his heel. You know, I can't explain, and I can't help but realize the dominoes that fell after Judas' kiss, the pain waiting for Christ. Truly, Judas is a mystery. No other disciple fascinates the mind like Judas. All the others we can understand, but even Peter. But Judas, he remains a mystery wrapped inside of a riddle. What made him tick? Was he crooked from the beginning? And I'm not trying to get you to answer. I'm just asking the question. Was he crooked? And if he was crooked, why would Jesus bring him in? Was he born to go to hell? I'll, I'll never believe that. In his hands. Judas held the little bag that contained the 30 pieces of silver. Had he even bothered to count it? No one noticed him now. It was like he was yesterday's news. No one had any use for a traitor, though the long night he had waited, hanging around the edges of the crowd, listening for some word of how things were going. What exactly did he expect? No one knows for sure. But if at midnight he wanted to see Jesus die, by sunrise he changed his mind. Amen. Memories kept gripping his mind. Things Jesus had said. Little jokes the apostles used to tell. Stories Jesus had told over and over again. Little pictures painted themselves in the darkness. The smile on the face of Jairus' daughter when Jesus raised her from the dead. The look of Peter's face when he walked on the water and it actually held him up. The picture of those 12 baskets of food left over after Jesus had fed the 5,000 plus women and children. He could see it all and hear it all and the memories were almost too much to bear. Just that. With that thought filling his mind, he took the bag of money and he tried to give it back. They wouldn't take it. But the chief priests laughed at him. They had no more use for the money or his money. Or him. They had what they wanted. You know, many people who truly feel sorry for their sins never come to God and ask for forgiveness. They, so, they just keep on. I, I feel bad about what I've done, but they never turn back to God. Never turn back to him. And Judas tried to undo his betrayal, but it was too late. And I, I do not doubt that he wept bitter tears as he threw the money back into the temple. Two weeks ago, I told you that hurting people hurt people. That when you're hurt, you hurt other people. I talked about those four A's. Anger always assassinates authority. Anytime you get angry, you will begin to assassinate a parent, a boss, a pastor, uh, whoever. Anger always assassinates. When you get angry, you've got to deal with your anger. And somehow Judas was angry. He was either angry over the money that uh, he could have had with Mary let down her hair with the alabaster box. Something happened. Something triggered inside of him. But I'll never believe he was born to go. And I, I'll be honest with you, I can't even tell you that Judas is in hell. I can tell you this. One scripture says in the book of Acts, by transgressions he fell. By trespass he fell. I'll leave it up to you. And then we got Pete. Peter. Peter. You know what Peter said? I'll never betray you. I'll never walk away. I, I, I won't do it. I ain't going to do it. Amen. At this moment, here, this happens. Under the pressure and the panic of that present day, 600 soldiers come up, Luke twenty-two fifty, 50, verse 50, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. 
He's right here. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and he healed him. <laughs> Can you imagine pulling out your knife and thinking for just a moment that you have the ability to take home 600 soldiers? Can you imagine thinking to yourself, all I got to do is pull out this knife and he'll, he'll bring angels in to help me out. All I got to do is just step up and make this happen. He wakes up. I don't know. What was he dreaming? What was Peter dreaming? I'm Superman. What was he dreaming? He wakes up and, and he's he looking like this. Jesus says, wake up. There's, there's Judas. He sees you. Well, there's the other disciple. I wonder what Judas is doing. He's kissing Jesus. And then he reaches, he sees the soldiers, and he grabs his sword, and he flies it through the night. And that ear pops off of Malchus's head and flips through the air. It falls into the dust. Blood is streaming down Malchus's white robe. He's the servant of the high priest. The pain of the loss of the ear. He can feel there's nothing there. It's like his cheek goes on forever. And Peter, now with blood on the end of his sword, realizes he just did something really stupid. And Jesus reaches down and picks up the ear. Wipes off the dirt. <laughs> and stuck it back on his head. I've often said if it was me, I'd have put it on backwards. <laughs> Just so he'd always know, you know. <laughs> but here's the thing. He had to go through the rest of the, the trial because he's a servant of the high priest with blood hanging on his ear and reaching up and pulling on his ear and it, it didn't come off thinking to himself you guys just witnessed a miracle this is the man we're going to crucify this is the man y'all hate so much why do people hate Jesus so much why is his name a curse word why is it in our politics people hate God? Why is it that Christianity has become a byword? Why is it in other countries that, I mean, countries that if you're a Christian, they want to kill you? Why in the name of God, for the love of Jesus, cannot people see, are so blind that they can't see this Jesus? who put Malchus's ear back on, who rose from the grave, who heals the sick, raises the dead. There's such a blindness in our world that people can't see it. And I, though I'm speaking to you about pressure and you handling pressure, you got to know that this world hates our God. This world hates it. And that this hatred is only going to get worse. As I prayed over Jules, I'm telling you, this world is only going to get worse. It's not going to get better. Only you can get better. Only you can decide. You know what? I love the one that put the ear back on. I love him. Peter, put up your sword. Put up your sword. Put it up, son. Matthew 26, verse 56. But all this has, was taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. And all his disciples deserted him and fled. I have this deep appreciation for what Christ went through on that night for us. How about you? Under pressure, do you wait? Will you wait? Not, not, don't move too quick. Don't sleep. Don't give up. Don't get complacent. Don't desire to drop out. How about the pressure of striking out? Do you know it's under pressure that we strike out? It's when somebody puts their finger on our trigger. There are certain people that know where your buttons are. 
They're usually living in your house. And they know where your buttons are. And they, they like to push in buttons, especially when you're under pressure. Don't strike. Don't strike. Jesus soothed. He put the ear back on. Amen. I, there's, there's witness. There's blood there, yes. But you're well. Close your eyes just a minute. I pray I painted the picture for you. I hope I planted it in your heart. Under pressure, don't, don't strike, don't cuss, don't fight your way out. But like Jesus, surrender. Not my will, but thine be done. Because this light affliction, which is but for a moment, works in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. If you're not sure of heaven, if you have felt the presence of God in your life, even, even this morning, and maybe you've been watching through the internet, this is a great opportunity for you. But on this moment, I'm telling you, eternity hinged. And for your life, eternity may hinge on what you do right now. Would you say, Pastor, I've been away from God. Pray for me this morning. I want, to, I want to get my life back right again. If that's you, would you put your hand up? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? There's three hands. I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I know what God's doing in this house. Pray this with me. Lord Jesus, I make a choice. I'm going to serve you. Forgive me of my sins, the pressure I've been under. I'm going to learn to wait. I'm going to surrender. I'm tired of striking out. I'm tired of being struck. Help me be a vessel of honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Come on, give me some praise in here. Amen. You should be awake by now. I feel better now than I did when I started. It's amazing the energy you get from the gospel. Amen. I need to do something quickly because I know time is, is moving by. Uh, if I get our servant leaders to come. 11, 11, 11 of our church folk are heading to Guatemala the day after Easter. Are you building two? They're going to build two homes. This is a missionary trip. They're going to build two homes. What I'd like for you to do, first, I want to challenge the givers in the house, not the tithers, the givers. I mean, no, there's a difference. I told you there's a difference. Tithing is training wheels. I always tithe. Giving is over and above. So I challenge the givers to give over and above I want to give $500. I got to get, we got to raise Tommy $5,500 to help these guys out over the next three Sundays so that we can make sure we help them. Most of them have already raised their own, a lot of their own money, over half their own money. But I think our church needs to support our missionaries that go 10 days, six days, six days to Guatemala. It's going to change their lives. Those that went last year, it changed their lives. We got new people going this year. But our missions, man, I was with a missionary this week who's just going to Ukraine, going to Germany. I have no passion to go to Ukraine. Do you, Craig? No. So what I'll do is I'll say, God, spend me. Let me help send them. Let me be a part of that. So you have an envelope there in front of you. And uh, you can take it home and pray over it. You can give uh, 20, 50, 100. You can take my challenge, give 500. Amen. But over the next three weeks, they were able to raise $5,500 between our two churches to help these folk that are going to Guatemala. I uh, appreciate your heart for missions. It's the heartbeat of God. Amen. He so loved the world. There's a, a window. It's a latitude, longitude, they call it. It's the 1040 window. If you look at it around the world, the 1040 window most of those folk have never heard of Jesus. If you fly a plane, you know a little bit about the 1040. 
Amen. It's, it's there in the middle. Most of those folk have never heard Jesus, and yet we're saturated with him. Let's let the whole world know. Amen. Amen. Here you go, bro. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours. Sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Thank you, Joseph.